in the worst of all possible worlds is that your life could be tragic but not hell. How good could you make it be? You have to be married, you have to have kids, you have to have a career, you have to have friends. That's good enough. You've had your life and you might come to an end, you know? Could you manage it? And if the answer is no, it's like, well, put your life together because it's going to happen. Maybe if you live your life thoroughly, thoroughly, right? You take use of the advantages, make use of the advantages that are put in front of you, make use of your talents, say yes to things, tell the truth, like stand up and get at it. Um, assuming that you can do that, you know, because some people are very ill and, and hurt. And But assuming you can do that, if you lived your life fully, maybe that would be good enough. Because, you know, I, I loved having kids, but I don't feel that I would have kids again you know because in some sense i've already done that and so maybe there's a set number of i mean i don't know uh, 10 years ago i thought you know if i could extend my life radically then i would and i'm not so sure about that now that i'm i'm 55 you know i'm getting older i kind of have a suspicion that you might come to an end you know that's what it looks like I mean, I don't want that to be soon, but maybe you exhaust yourself in your life, you know, maybe you can, so that there's nothing left of you, really. Life is, has got its rat's nest of miseries, and that's for sure, and maybe you could even make a categorical statement that life is mostly a rat's nest of misery, you know, and you could make a pretty powerful argument for that. But then there's a counter question, which is, well, what if you tried not to make it any more miserable than it had to be, right? Then what, then what would it be like? And my suspicions are is that a lot of that misery, I would suspect that most of that misery would go away. Because it's the unnecessary misery that really brings you down, you know? It's like, well, if someone has cancer, it's like, that sucks. But it's not like, it's not like you can say, if only we had done this differently, then that wouldn't have happened. But when someone's out, like, torturing you in a malevolent way, or maybe you're doing the same, you can always ask yourself, well, is it really? Is this really necessary? Is this just, like, a useless add-on to the miseries of life? That's what disheartens people. And so even in your own life, if, if, you, if, if you aren't suffering from self-imposed misery, and you're only suffering from inescapable misery, maybe you could handle that. And, you know, you could, you could survive. You could bear it. And, and even maybe without becoming irredeemably corrupt and so the goal would be well yeah life is a rat's nest of miseries and maybe it has no ultimate meaning we could say that if we're feeling particularly pessimistic but it still leaves one question open which is if you didn't do everything you could to make it worse how good could you make it be and the, the least answer is well it, it could be tragedy but maybe not hell and, and I think that's right I really believe that that's that's the most pessimistic proper statement the worst case outcome in the worst of all possible worlds, is that your life could be tragic, but not hell. And that's a lot better than hell, right? It's, it's, and you think, I could give you an example of the difference. You're at your mother's deathbed. Well, that's tragedy. Here's another scenario. You're at your mother's deathbed, and all you, you and all your idiot siblings are arguing. Well, that's the difference between tragedy and hell. And you might be able to tolerate the first circumstance, and maybe it would even bring you closer together with your family members. The second one? No one can bear that. You walk away from a situation like that, sick of yourself and sick of everything else too. And you know, it's often the case that tragic circumstances bring out the dragons because the stress is high and all those things that people haven't dealt with, they don't have the energy to repress and, and all the bitterness comes pouring forward. It's like, seriously, man. So that's actually a good, it's a rough lesson, but it's a good hallmark for figuring out whether or not you're you've got yourself adjusted properly and in relationship to your siblings it's like if you were all gathered around the bed of someone close who was dying could you manage it and if the answer is no it's like well put your life together because it's going to happen and you should be the person who's there that can do it and do it properly and then maybe you'd find that it isn't the sort of thing that will undermine your faith in life itself and I've seen, I've seen both of those situations, you know, ugly, ugly, ugly situations, you know, murderously ugly situations. And then they're opposite, where people have had terrible things happen to, happen to them as a family. And, you know, they pull together and they rebuild their damn ship and they sail away. So that seems to me to be a lot better. 
That's how people usually identify. Maybe they have no plan at all and they're just in chaos, right? That's like being in the belly of the beast. They're nihilistic in chaos. They have no plan. They're just chaos itself. And that's a very dreadful situation for people to be in. Or maybe they conjure together a plan. That's their identity. It's kind of fragile and they're holding on to that with, with everything they've got. It's their little stick of wood that they're floating in the ocean clinging to. You know, and so they're identifying really hard with that plan. That's what happens when you're an ideologue, is that you're identifying really hard with that plan. The problem is, if something comes up to confront it, well, how do you act? Well, you can't let go of the plan, because you drown. And then you cling to it rigidly. Well, that's no good, because then you can't learn anything. And then, and if that's you, you're a totalitarian, you're not going to learn anything. You're going to end up in something that's close enough to hell so that you won't know the difference, and you might drag everyone along with you. And that's happened plenty of times, right? It's the whole story of the 20th century. It happened over and over and over. And it happens in people's states. It happens in their business organizations. It happens in their cities. It happens in their provinces. It happens in their states. And it happens in their psyches, all at the same time. You can't blame the manifestation of that sort of thing on any of those one levels. It happens when a society goes down, that way, it goes down everywhere at the same time. It's not the totalitarians at the top and all the happy people striving to be free at the bottom. It's not that at all. It's totalitarianism at every single level of the hierarchy, including the psychological. And so you don't want to be the thing, you don't want to be in chaos, that's for sure, but you don't want to be the thing that clings so desperately to the raft that you can't let go when someone comes to rescue you, right? You don't want to be that. So then you think, well, exactly what are you? You're not the chaos, you're not the plan. Maybe you're the thing that confronts the obstacle. And I would say that's the categorical lesson of, of psychology insofar as it has to do with personal transformation. Because that's what you always teach people in psychotherapy. I don't care what sort of psychotherapist you are. You're always teaching them the same thing. You're the thing that can, you're not, you're not the plan. You're the thing that can confront the obstacle to the plan. And then when you know even further that the obstacle is not only an obstacle, but opportunity itself, well, then your whole view of the world can change because you might think, well, I've got this plan. Something came up to object to it. It's like, it's possible that the thing that's objecting has something to teach you that will take you to the place where you develop an even better plan. That's a nice framework to use. It's like, are you so sure that this is a problem? Is that the only way that you can look at it? Or is it an opportunity? I mean, I'm not trying to be, you know, naively optimistic. There are some things that's pretty hard to extract gold from some dragons, and maybe the death of a family member is a good example of that. But in, even in a situation like that, I can tell you that it's an opportunity for, it's an opportunity for maturation, that's for sure. And the thing is, you might say, well, it's pretty miserable to go, to be digging for gold when someone's falling into the grave. Well, if they really love you, first of all, that's what they'll want you to do. And second, you're going to make their death a lot more palatable experience for them if you're someone who can be in the room and be helpful instead of be, you know, quivering in the corner and feeling that the entire world is collapsing in on you. I mean, that's another. You want to be the useful person at the funeral. How's that for a goal? That's a good goal, man. You know that you've got yourself together in a situation like that because you're going to be at them. And maybe you want to be the person on whose shoulder people cry. That'd be a good goal. It's kind of, you know, I don't like being naively optimistic. So when I tell you to get your life together, I'm not going to say roses and sunshine. It's like that's, 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 that's pablum for fools. But it really is something to be the reliable person at a funeral, right? And you can aim at that. You can do that. It's, and you've got to be tough to do that because it also means that you can sustain a major loss without collapsing. And that, you've got to be a monster to do that, right?